Okay, so the second thing I want to talk about is the labeling. So data labeling, there's kind of three things. One is the interface for labeling. The second is the source of labor, the labeling labor. And then three is uh, kind of, are there companies that can just do the labeling for you? So in a labeling tool, there's kind of a standard set of features. For vision tasks, there's bounding boxes, um, segmentation, so that would be like a freeform polygon, key points for like face detection, um, cuboids for 3D data and video, and all the providers you see are gonna have the same set of features. What is crucial is training the annotators, right? And so here on the left, we have a figure that is basically like instructions to the annotator. So the, the label in green is, the, is like the desired label. The labels in red are either too wide or too narrow around the fox. And the reason it's so crucial is because there's reasonable decisions to make, right? So if you're labeling a fox, but the fox is partially behind the rock, do you label the whole fox as you imagine it or only the part that you can actually see, right? And so reasonable people will disagree about what to do. So it's crucial to actually tell people what to do. So like break all the ties and all these decisions. Assuring quality is key. So that would be um, just watching your annotators and making sure they do a good job. The sources of labor, you could hire your own annotators and then that you can really control the process uh, the most effectively at that point, because you can see which ones are the best. You can maybe promote them to quality control, have them train other ones. It's secure, because they sign a contract with you. It's fast once you hire them. And maybe less quality control is needed because you, you, you trust them more. There's more trust in the system. Uh, the cons are it's expensive. You actually have to hire them, which is maybe slow to scale, because you actually have to find real people. And there's admin overhead to, to managing the group of people. You could crowdsource, which Mechanical Turk is this uh, Amazon offering for doing that. Um, so Chris said he co-founded the company called Figure 8. It, it was called Crowdflower at first, and, and they were kind of in that business, right? So having people just out in the world label da data for machine learning, it's a, definitely a, a thing to do. Uh, full service data labeling companies are just kind of taking that business model and making it really nice, so I don't have to worry about like, am I getting bad annotators? All I have to say, I just basically have to train the data labeling company how to do it, and then they'll figure out how to train their annotators how to do it, and they'll give me good results. So I wanna talk more about those service companies. So the way I see it, like data labeling is really its own project, right? You need a separate software stack of your annotation interface, maybe some kind of quality control uh, software. You have like temporary labor needs, you have quality assurance needs. So you don't want to build all of that yourself. So I think it makes sense to outsource it. So what I would do if I had a problem where I needed to label a lot of data is I'd probably dedicate you know, several days to picking service companies that could be in the running and then assigning each one a data sample. Uh, to assign them a data sample, I would need to first label kind of gold standard data myself just to make sure that I understand the full complexity of what's in this data and how I would want it labeled. And then as I have my gold standard data set, I would send that same data set to the different contenders and then basically compare like how did they do it versus how did I do it. Uh, and then pricing could be a big thing. So talk about that. Figure eight, you know, the original data, com data labeling company, over 100 million images labeled, over 1 billion human judgments in last year, 2018. And they've been around for over a decade at this point. So that's definitely a contender. Scale.ai is kind of like a up and comer that seems to be very dominant, especially in the self-driving car space. And their maybe selling point is you, you almost treat it as an API call. So you almost don't need to think of it as like, a data labeling, you almost think of it as a prediction problem. So if you have like a piece of a new image that you want labeled, you make an API call to scale.ai and in some amount of time they'll return it to you and it'll be labeled uh, presumably perfectly. So there's a ton of others too. There's Labelbox, there's Supervisely, there's really a ton of them and uh, you just have to kind of evaluate them for, for your own use case. So 
what's a reason to not do this? Well, it is more pricey, right? So they charge you overhead for actually hiring people and assuring quality and having, like an, an, having it be a nice experience. So if you don't want to pay that premium, then you can use your own labor, but you, could, you should still probably try to use their software. Because like I said, it's a separate software stack that you would otherwise have to find open source solutions for or build yourself. So Prodigy is an example of, of this. Um, Prodigy is an annotation tool mostly for NLP, but not only, also for, for vision tasks. And their interesting thing is they, they have like a nice interface. So you hire your own annotators. They sit you know, maybe in your office or at their home, but in the Prodigy interface. And Prodigy interface is a nice interface, but also has cool stuff about active learning. So maybe it suggests like the least certain um, data samples to the annotators. And it has user interfaces for different types of labeling tasks. So that solves the problem. Like you don't have to build this UI anymore. My conclusions are, if you can afford it, outsource to a full service company like figure eight or, or scale.ai. Um, if, you, if you cannot afford that, then at least try to use existing software. So at least you don't have to build your own software to do this. But if you're f uh, hiring your own labor, I think it makes sense to actually hire part-time people, for example, on Upwork, rather than try to make Amazon Mechanical Turk work. Because Amazon Mechanical Turk, there's just so much extra complexity um, added from the fact that the annotators are like very eph ephemeral and poorly paid. So you really have to have like a separate layer of quality control on top of the basic annotation. Whereas if you hired part-time people and you invested in training them, after you trained them, you could, you could trust them to actually just do it correctly. You guys have any questions? So let's say that you have um, no time or money to do quality control for your labels. Is there a way to make your models more robust towards outliers or bad samples? I want to say no. I think. It's just hard to say that your model is robust against certain parts of the data distribution when you don't actually have that data distribution as part of your data set. So does that make sense? So your model might be robust against stuff you haven't seen before, but it might not be robust against stuff you haven't seen before. And the only way to tell is to actually label that stuff and test it. And if it's not robust against it, then you put it in the training set and make sure that the model uh, trains on it. The next question is about ensembling data labels. Um, so, you know, for example, if you have, um, like, if you have, say, some image task, like you're trying to um, predict bounding boxes, what you can do is you can just have um, uh, a bunch of labelers do the same task, and you can just pick sort of majority rule, or you can average them. Um, and so the question is. Um, how do you ensemble data labels when the results are somewhat subjective, like for ranking problems? Or can you even do that? Does that concept even make sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good question. I think it might, like, so ranking, right, so like different people will disagree on the exact ranking of some data items. That's kind of the question. So how do you deal with that? I mean, I think there's just different answers kind of depending on what problem you're working on. So one answer could be to bin them. So maybe like one thing is clearly high quality, one thing is clearly low quality, and then one thing is subject to disagreement. So like one thing is always in top three of every labeler, one thing is always in bottom three. So you can maybe, from your kind of noisy labels, extract clean labels by following some rules like that. But the other is to treat it as a regression problem. So instead of predicting the exact rank, you could predict the average rank. So I don't know. It's hard to say more without actually having the problem. Do you know of good ways to leverage negative examples? So say that you have a, a user interface where um, you present someone with a bunch of images, and then they, um, they sort of verify one of them. They, they pick the one that they care the most about. Um, can you take advantage of all the other images that don't belong to the class of interest? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And I think it kind of gets at a larger question, which is what are like innovative labeling interfaces, potentially? So Jeremy Howard, actually, in the spring, was a guest lecturer here. And um, there's a thing he's working on called platform.ai, which I encourage you to check out. But the point of that 
uh, application is actually like innovative data labeling interfaces. And so there, it's, you know, I'm not going to do it justice, but basically by combining some machine learning with some human input, uh, he was able to kind of scale up data collection very rapidly, so including using tricks like this. So like if you don't select something, that's signal to everything else. So I think that, that's a great question. It's maybe something we should include in these slides also, just like data labeling interfaces that are not just like labeling this exact thing you're looking at, because it's a very interesting uh, area. Yeah, well, they, yeah, the question is, let's say, in ranking or search results, uh, if they search for something and then they click on a link, then is that the right thing? Does that mean that none of the other links were correct? I mean, it might or might not. I mean, I think that's the source of difficulty. Maybe that was the best link, but maybe it was just a random link they clicked on, right? So I think... The, the, the answer is like, this is an area of research and an area of development, and it's kind of complicated.